Hi, I'm Kelly Giordano with Newman's Own Foundation. In 1982, Paul Newman and his friend A.E. Hotchner had a single great salad dressing and a single great idea, that 100% of any profits made from Newman's Own products would be given away. Since 1982, Newman's Own Foundation has done just that, donating more than half a billion dollars to worthy charities around the globe. And Paul was an avid supporter of public television. He believed in the power of public television to inform, inspire, and build stronger communities. And now, we're excited to announce a special Newman's Own Foundation challenge just for NJTV. Through the entire month of March, Newman's Own Foundation will match your contribution dollar for dollar up to $25,000. So call or go online right now and we can double your donation. Any contribution, large or small, will help NJTV meet this challenge. Together we can support the essential and inspiring programming on New Jersey Public Television. Thank you. Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. Independent College Fund of New Jersey, in partnership with McCarter and English, providing legal strategies to help drive our clients' businesses forward for 175 years. And PSE&G, we make things work for communities. Tonight on NJTV News, courting supporters ahead of Monday's marijuana vote. Governor Murphy's lobbying hard for yes votes to legalize recreational marijuana, mobilizing advocates in the minority community to argue that it's a matter of social justice. The Senate Budget Committee heard directly from constituents who made the case for their spending priorities in this year's budget. It's a take two for New Jersey's film tax credit program, this time with incentives to employ more women and minority groups. Plus, the state's liquor license laws haven't changed much since prohibition. Should they be changed now? And it might be a good time to get a mortgage. We'll tell you why. Those stories are more next on NJTV News. <laughs> from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway Center in Newark. This is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us on air and online. Governor Murphy still needs votes to legalize recreational weed, and today he focused on social justice aspects of the bill, saying expungement of low-end marijuana records could have an impact on the lives of nearly 200,000 people in New Jersey, most of them people of color. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports. The status quo was unacceptable. Backed by a star lineup of social justice advocates, Governor Murphy sees the bully pulpit to argue legalizing recreational marijuana is nothing less than a civil rights issue. The event seemed to target holdouts among black caucus members in the legislature who say it doesn't do enough to repair the ravages of the war on drugs. New Jersey has the opportunity to literally set captives free from prison, probation, parole, and a life stigmatized and shackled by a criminal record. One by one, speakers stepped up to the mic to argue the bill set for a showdown vote on Monday isn't perfect, but will stop the plague of marijuana arrests among people of color. One of the talking points has been that marijuana is a gateway drug, a gateway drug. And we agree it's a gateway to county jail or state prison if you are black or brown. New Jersey makes more than 32,000 marijuana arrests per year, and black New Jerseyans are nearly three times more likely to be arrested for marijuana possession. These numbers alone make legalization a civil rights issue. As an attorney that, that specializes in labor and employment, I can't tell you how often this issue comes across my desk. And it's unfortunate because it truly is such a dispor disproportionate rate of black and brown that are affected. That needs to be addressed. And this legislation does that. So hopefully on Monday, this does get passed because the longer that it stays not passed is the longer that we go away in handcuffs. And it's just not fair. 
The marijuana legalization bill creates a five-member commission. One must be a social justice advocate. Licenses will be awarded based on points with priority given to impact zones. Cities of 120,000 people or more with a history of marijuana-related crime and poverty. 30% of licenses will be reserved for minorities, women, and disabled vets. 10% for micro-businesses to ensure retailers aren't swamped by corporate interests. Expungement will address offenses involving five or less pounds of marijuana and will dismiss pending charges and cases and expedite expungement for older ones, with the court responsible for gathering relevant documents at no charge. Although this bill still lacks robust and overt community reinvestment, it is another major step in dismantling and abolishing the war on black and brown people. Thousands will reap the benefit of vacated or reduced sentences and expunged records. By any sober assessment, all pun intended, <laughs> this is real liberation and this is real transformation. This late push from the governor comes as vote whipping has left the measure shy of support it needs to pass. I'm an optimist by nature. We are not there yet, though. Let me just say this. We are not there yet. We have to move uh, a, a number of chess pieces still in both the Assembly and the Senate, and it's going to take all of us collectively to do that. Sources say Monday's vote will be very close. If the bill fails, chances are it will gather dust until after the next election. In Trenton, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. And that's the reason Governor Murphy's been rolling through his Rolodex, trying to amass enough votes to make recreational marijuana legal. But senior correspondent David Cruz reports getting to a yes can be a tough sell. David? The budget process, which is now officially underway, can be all-consuming. But Trenton has a lot more on its mind nowadays. You have the growing tempest over hiring at the Schools Development Authority, which could become the next chapter of the still-unfinished Katie Brennan hearings, and now the 11th hour of the legal cannabis battle. Six votes shy, at least in the Senate, the governor is on the offensive. Some of his vote targets were at the Senate Budget Committee meeting today. And from the sound of it, they remain unconvinced. It's going to evolve over time. There's, there's no doubt about it. Uh, I have been opposed to it. I think it's a societal change. Uh, I'm looking at all of the merits, uh, the pros and cons of this. Uh, but at this point in time, I, I believe this will happen over. A, it'll be a societal change. Uh, the more, more states will come on board. Um, I, I just think we need to take our time on this. So you're not ready for a yes vote? Uh, at this point in time, I'm, I'm keeping my options open. I have concerns. Uh, I have public safety concerns. I have concerns on how this is going to affect um, our children. And, you know, I, we've been hearing a lot about the uh, um, behavioral issues that can come from this. So um, I'm still considering it, but, you know, right now I'm not there. So you're right now still a no? Yes. To be clear, that's yes meaning no. Senator Nitsa Cruz Perez didn't want to talk on camera about her vote, but she has been adamant in the past about the ravages of drugs on her district in Camden. It's a safe bet that she is leaning no, and getting her to the yes column is going to be a heavy lift. All the lawmakers we talked to today say they've been getting calls from the governor and others, but it's not clear that any of it is having much of an impact, at least at the moment. Mary Alice. Thank you, David. To dive deeper into this story, head to NJSpotlight.com. Reporter Carly Citron has written a comprehensive analysis of what's in New Jersey's landmark marijuana bill. Less alluring, perhaps, than pot, but more impactful is the process of cutting deals to finalize a state budget, a crucial part of which is public input. It was the state Senate's turn to hear from constituents. Joanna Gagas was at NJIT for the hearing. We're asking the legislature to consider an allocation of $550,000 to match the federal money so that we can serve more families. The impassioned pleas came one after the other. People asking members of the Senate Budget Committee to fund their programs, their schools, their commutes. We must begin to increase state funding for transit at a greater rate and in a sustained manner. 
We believe the proposed budget should be increased by at least a real $100 million, a 4 to 5 percent increase, if we want to make more substantial progress in addressing what New Jersey's mass transit customers need. Some ask for restoration to school aid that was cut last year as part of the School Funding Reform Act, saying the changes will mean the elimination of 232 staff members and vacancies, 150 of which are classroom teachers. Programs that were established to meet priority needs will be cut to the tune of $52 million. These cuts will devastate our schools. Others decried the recent minimum wage increase and the impact it'll have on them. Once minimum wage goes up, we will be beyond a crisis. We need $54 million of state funding to increase salaries for the direct support professionals. We must, we must be 25 percent above minimum wage to be competitive. And of course, no budget discussion would be complete without talk of a millionaire's tax. By including a true millionaire's tax, it asks those who have benefited the most from our excellent New Jersey schools, strong economy, and federal tax cuts to contribute their fair share so everyone can look better forward to a better future. But even among this Senate committee, you'll find differing points of view on that issue. If we're going to tax someone, let's tax the millionaire and not the working families of New Jersey. I don't think we can keep taxing our people because simply we are losing the middle class. Uh, there's many folks who are opposed to having any tax. If we were to oppose the millionaire's tax, uh, to find the additional savings uh, in the budget, uh, cuts and savings uh, to offset that, uh, and then allow the governor to have his billion dollar surplus. So listen, we're at a really good starting point. This is the first of two public hearings the Senate Budget Committee will hold. The next one will be at the end of the month in South Jersey, more constituents asking for more money from a legislature that says the priority is to find savings in this year's budget. In Newark, Joanna Gagas, NJTV News. It's jobs that have the attention of the state's business sector. Here with that and more is Rhonda Schaffler. Rhonda? Mary Alice, the chairman of the Federal Reserve told us just yesterday there are signs the economy is slowing. We may be seeing a little bit of that in New Jersey as the state's economy did lose jobs last month. According to government estimates, total employment decreased by 7,700 in February. The drop did follow four straight months of job gains. These losses were spread out over a number of private sector industries. Local governments, however, reported an increase in the number of jobs. The state's unemployment rate held steady at 4 percent. That is higher than the national average. Credit rating agency Moody's says New Jersey is going to need a big boost in tax revenue in order to make up for its current shortfall. Moody's says to meet the state's budget estimates, revenue collected from income taxes would have to increase 17 percent through the remainder of this fiscal year. Moody's says it's uncertain whether that can actually happen. Moody's also states a fiscal 2019 revenue shortfall would make it more difficult to meet the governor's fiscal 2020 forecast. The governor's proposed budget is not winning over the state's accountants. According to a poll conducted by the New Jersey Society of Certified Public Accountants, 70 percent of the nearly 500 CPAs surveyed believe the proposed budget will make the state's economy worse over the long term. Only 12 percent said it would make the economy better. 17 percent said it would stay the same. Those who responded negatively cited the millionaire's tax, high property taxes, and the governor not focusing enough on the amount of spending on public pension benefits. The governor's budget includes spending cuts for health care for public workers, and workers have officially agreed to accept that. Members of the CWA ratified their new state worker contract, agreeing to changes in their health care plans. The deal also contains pay increases of 2 percent each year through 2023. Newark is teaming up with the economic development organization Choose New Jersey. Newark Alliance and Choose New Jersey will combine marketing and other efforts. Newark Mayor Raz Baraka says the partnership will help the city to grow as a business center. Mortgage rates continue to fall. According to the mortgage agency Freddie Mac, rates are at their lowest level in more than a year. The average rate on a 30-year fixed rate mortgage is now 4.28 percent. On Wall Street, stocks rallied with the Dow closing. 216 points higher. And those are your top business stories.
Two months after discovering elevated levels of lead in some homes in North Jersey, Suez Water says it'll start removing more than nine miles of lead pipes in some 2,400 service lines that run through 16 towns in Hudson and Bergen counties. The $15 million project targets 25% of lead in the system. Suez says it plans to eventually remove all the lead, but hasn't said when. The state attorney general's busted what he's called a drug mill, trafficking in brands of heroin and fentanyl linked to hundreds of overdoses and 84 deaths. Three men are under arrest, accused of supplying as much as 15,000 doses of the lethal drugs per day. New Jersey's been awarded more than 11 and a quarter billion dollars to respond to the still expanding opioid epidemic. U.S. Senators Menendez and Booker announced the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services funding to treat addicts, help their families, and reduce the use of opioids in emergency rooms. The state's decades-old liquor laws are up for reconsideration in the Assembly, but the Oversight, Reform, and Federal Relations Committee is hearing there's a downside to an update. Leah Mishkin was there. The liquor license laws in New Jersey haven't changed much since Prohibition. One small move in the wrong direction can irreparably damage many existing license holders, families, individuals that are struggling to make a living in this state. Kashmir Gill owns a handful of gas stations with convenience stores across the state. With the, the increase in uh, smoking age, our cigarette sales are out of window. Carbonated sales is down because parents don't want their kids to drink soda. So the opportunities at the gas station and, and retail outlets have gone down big time. Gill says the opportunity to sell beer and wine would be a game changer, something currently illegal under New Jersey law. Sal Rizalvado represents convenience stores. He'd like to see a new type of liquor license made available to convenience stores, particularly those associated with gas stations. I'd like to point out that in the other states of the country, that 80% of the convenience stores, and again, I underline that word convenience stores, sell beer and wine. We're not asking to be able to become a liquor store and sell all kinds of liquor. In New Jersey, any corporate entity can't own more than two liquor licenses. There was testimony today trying to get that cap raised to 10. Back in 2015, we um, acquired 71 A&P stores that the company went bankrupt. They were going out of business, five of which had grandfathered uh, liquor licenses. Um, we purchased those stores with the anticipation of being able to activate the licenses. The vice president of operations of Acme Markets, Bill Crosby, says because they already had two in play, they were unable to use the A&P licenses. Alcohol has become part of the, the food shopping experience, um, and, and New Jersey consumers want to see beer, wine, and spirits in their supermarkets. Because there are only roughly 9,000 liquor licenses in circulation in the state, people have been paying hundreds of thousands of dollars, and in some cases, over a million to get their hands on one. Those people believe they're at risk of losing their investment if the system is flooded with more licenses. Current license holders say you can't all of a sudden change the system without compensation. Members of the Beer Wholesalers Association also voice concern. In 2011, the state of Washington underwent massive deregulation. That has led to an increase in liquor stores from 328 to over 1,700. At the same time, prices increased by more than 15% and fewer brands were available. Small liquor stores began failing, small producers lost money, and shoplifting and underage drinking have increased. As the chairman said, it's a topic 71 years in the making. They plan on having another hearing to continue the conversation. In Trenton, Leah Mishkin, NJTV News. A change that could have a big impact on rooming houses. That tops tonight's Garden State Express. A first stop, Atlantic City, where there are limits on the number of rooming houses within a thousand feet of each other and the number of people who can legally occupy them. The city counts 43 licensed operators in all. Now an ordinance introduced before the city council would streamline the process of appealing code violations, but also more than double the maximum allowable fine for violations from $2,000 each to 5000 
Next to Galloway Township, where the plan to build nearly a thousand new homes at Blue Heron Pines East is dead. The Pinelands Commission approved developing the 368-acre parcel a decade ago. Just as the nation sunk into recession, the housing market has yet to rebound, so now the owner is relinquishing approvals for the project, just as the South Jersey Transportation Authority is looking for an alternative site as a habitat for the state-endangered upland sandpiper, the state-threatened grassland sparrow, and frosted elfin butterfly. Finally, Long Branch, where the Gilded Age Mansion, where St. Catherine Drexel summered as a child, is slated for demolition. Preservationists had fought to save the storied 1868 cottage, where Catherine answered the call to be a nun, gave up her $7 million fortune, and devoted her life to religious and charitable works. She went on to found the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament. In 1941, the Sisters of St. Joseph of Peace purchased it as a retreat called it Stella Maris. Now the family that owns the rainbow shops will raise it and replace it with a family compound. And that's our Garden State Express for Thursday, March 21st. Something up in your neighborhood? Tip us off. The state where the motion picture camera was invented is hoping to become Hollywood East by offering renewed tax credits to attract industry moguls. But like any good film, there is a subplot. Brianna Vernozzi reports. Major film production locations typically include Hollywood, even New York City, and the major leading roles have typically been played by white male actors. But according to New Jersey leaders, that's about to change. We are getting a lot of interest uh, because of these tax credits, because of the tax credit. Uh, a lot of folks are, are even more interested than they already have been. Thanks to the revival of the New Jersey film tax credit, it went dark during the Christie administration and during several strokes of the veto pen. Governor Murphy reinstated a new five-year, $75 million program last year, and industry leaders say it's booming with a new element, a tax credit to incentivize diversity. The Murphy administration is taking the lead in encouraging businesses to grow here. While we do that, we must encourage them to reflect who we are. It's being touted at the state's first ever diversity in film forum held in Newark, launching the program that offers production companies a 30% transferable tax credit if they work in North Jersey and a 35% credit if they use South Jersey locations. Companies can get a 2% bonus for meeting the diversity standard, employing at least 15% women and other minority groups in key creative positions and as members of their production crew. We are all about making sure that the status quo now represents all of us. What that obviously does is help to ignite uh, not only just film in the city of Newark, but a lot of young black and brown and minorities in the city who are striving to be in the film industry, who are working hard, who may not have the opportunity uh, to break in as everybody else does. Industry insiders from Sony, Paramount, and NBC Universal, to name a few, led the forum panel, pointing to blockbusters like Black Panther and Crazy Rich Asians for pushing boundaries with diverse casts. We want to tell great stories and we want to do great business. And part of great storytelling is having storytelling that has emotional resonance. And emotional resonance comes from authenticity, and authenticity comes from actual experience. Critics argue the benefits may not outweigh the cost. A report from the State Office of Legislative Services show indirect state and local revenue gain was indeterminate with the tax credits. Still, with the lights back on, it seems the companies are a knocking. We're dealing with practically every major uh, network, every major studio, not to mention a lot of independent production companies. So we have big budget productions all the way from the $200 million type mo movies to, you know, features and uh, that are being done for $100,000. So the, the full gamut. More than a dozen productions are gearing up to start filming in the state over the next few months. According to the EDA, the question is how many more 
will take advantage of this diversity credit. In Newark, Brianna Venosi, NJTV News. some noteworthy facts that help you know Jersey. Suez Water plans to replace 2,400 lead service lines by the end of the year. The Office of Management and Budget says the state's budget process begins in August and ends in June. In 1892, Edison and Dixon invented a motion picture camera called the Kinetoscope. And both Seton Hall and Fairleigh Dickinson University are competing in the NCAA men's basketball tournament tonight. If there's somebody you'd like to get to know Jersey, share. Use hashtag no Jersey. Tomorrow on NJTV News, ahead of the new census, a push to get everyone counted, it counts. And NJ Spotlight dives into the health ratings county by county. You can sign up for their daily newsletter. Go to njspotlight.com and click on NJ Spotlight Newsletters. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to NJ, njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, we'll see you tomorrow. J. Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association.